Last July, I heard of Jeff Briggs' work to create Newberry statues of historical people. Initially, I thought to myself, the Customs House has been trying to recruit people to come and see the museum from all different areas. Why would anyone want to come and just see statues of Newberry poor people? <laughs> when I visited Jeff's studio, I immediately saw the artistic process and the historical significance of each person that would deliver the information that really could be for any visitor from anywhere. I believe at the time, Jeff had about nine sculptures completed and he was looking for a venue. I agreed it would be a great exhibit and there would be very little for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff came with a proposal and modest budget for materials to construct the pedestals, labels, and frames. We met several times to measure the gallery, agree on paint color, and layout. We started to have a plan. Jeff always told me, he's just an artist, not the historian or the writer. So who would write the interpretation needed for this exhibit. Enter Skip and Marge Moats. They stopped working on their book, Among the Whales. My first meeting with the exhibition committee, <laughs> Marge asked me, what font do I see in the exhibition is having? And what is the word count for the labels? We were a long ways off. <laughs> in my career, I've worked on many exhibitions but mainly from a curatorial side with a much larger team of designers, writers, educators, and store merchandise. We were a team of four. In the coming weeks, we would wrestle and brainstorm for show title, defining the criteria for the selection, and who else could be included in the final representation of the 18th and 19th century legendary Newberry Porters. The exhibition catalog grew to be a book, and the budget grew with it. Jeff assured me that he produced books before, and his book designer, Cameron Sesto, and Rose Russo of Pathworks Designs would be responsible for the artistic brand and layout. Phew. <laughs> By October, I thought this is an exhibition coming fully intact, and there is little to do but shepherd and track the progression. Was I wrong? <laughs> Jeff had many questions. And we met regularly, at first, uncertain who was in charge. Marge and Skip put in, started putting together deadlines, a list of historians tasked for their part. I kept my head low when asked who would write the foreword. But a committee of four, you can't really fade easily. <laughs> People asked about my marketing plan or my development strategy. The excitement and momentum continued to grow. We initially thought to open in February, and many questioned the decision to launch a new exhibit during COVID. And I am glad we adjusted our schedule to really put forth the effort to make this exhibition, book, and video what it is today, the level of quality you see. The delayed opening allowed us to comb through all texts for grammar, spelling, and checking facts. It also provided the necessary time to need to address some of the little things like marketing and development. <laughs> It allowed time on two occasions that Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing mailed their paper book in a paper envelope in a New England nor'easter. <laughs> and we had to reorder the proof again. Only those desperate enough would put, to think to put the book in the oven to dry out. Fog and bottle. are now here and on sale in the museum store, and we have kept that store open this evening. The delay in opening also allowed us to develop some store products and time to fundraise, make connections to the school and to the community. We had more time to also consider elements that we had not thought of in the initial planning. Jason Novak and Jeff made a second video showcasing the exhibition for those who cannot travel and climb the granite Customs House stairs. Those will now be available on our YouTube website as well as our exhibitions page. So the exhibit you see today is a result of many volunteers, contributors, and sponsors. Thanks to the H. Patterson Hale Jr. Charitable Foundation as a presenting sponsor and to the Newburyport Bank as the major sponsor. 
both sponsors far exceeded my, my expectation to support this initiative. Charles and Gillian Griffin sponsored the video production for casting Timothy Palmer that demystifies the creative process of casting. And we started to receive support from citizens interested in history or a strong connection to one of the legendary Newberry Porters. It was amazing to work with so many dedicated people who kept a sense of humor and perspective with each new challenge we face. Marge last counted over three dozen people worked on this initiative to bring it to a reality. So this is just my perspective, and tonight you will have an opportunity to hear from the panel of others involved in the process. Jeff Briggs, the artist and main reason we're all here. Skip and Marge votes. Unfortunately, Marge is not here tonight, but Skip is. And I want to thank them both for their kindness and direction, and sometimes redirection. I learned a lot from them both, especially when things got messed up. <laughs> Bethany Goff Duro was a voice and advocate for negotiations, and Bob Watts, who captured all the raw footage for the Timothy Palmer um, casting video, and is tonight's facilitator. So feel free to interject with questions, but at the end we'll also have a more formal question and answer session. So first I'd like Jeff to say a few words. I'm not used to talking to audiences. I usually spend my time alone in a room by myself. So I, uh, I perhaps don't say as much as I should, but this whole experience has been really incredible. Uh, I've spent most of my career working with committees of people doing major projects, one type or another. But this one is far beyond anything that I've ever been involved with. And it's astounding what's come forward out of this little thing that I started. So uh, I just would like to thank you all for all your support and all your uh, incredible uh, enthusiasm for this uh, little thing that I started. And we'll explain it further as we go along, but um, I guess that's good enough for now. <laughs> Uh, Jeffrey, you're a, a true artist and a creator. And as you've said, artists never retire. So you've done a great job here. I can imagine there's more down the pike. Jeffrey, you've shared that with your arrival at Newburyport, you became aware of an extraordinary legacy of distinguished citizens from the past, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries, and that you wished to bring them to life in the form of maquettes, I didn't know that word. <laughs> he taught me. Please tell us about your vision of the project. Uh, well, when my wife, first, wife and I first came to town in 1973, uh, <laughs> the place was boarded up and I joked that there, <laughs> there wasn't a coat of paint on any building in the town at the time. Uh, but it had an ambiance about it that was just incredible. You know, and everybody that's come here has felt the same thing over and over again. Yet, I was astounded that the town itself doesn't celebrate the people who created this place and did the things that they did here. So over the years, I made several proposals to the powers that be for celebration of some of these historic people that were so amazing to me. And each time I was sort of pushed aside, I guess is the way to say it. Or the timing wasn't right or whatever. So when I got to the point where I was quote unquote retired, which an artist never really retires, but I took up the task of expressing what I thought that some of these people should look like on my own. I started the first six days and then after a while, I realized that I was certainly inadequate as to venturing forward because I just didn't have the knowledge of the history of the people involved. 
that I was trying to portray. So the, it blossomed into something more when I approached the Mozes about helping me find people that could help me interpret the history around each one of these different figures. Uh, Marge Motz jumped in with both feet, unbelievable person, and she kept shuffling people to me constantly to uh, advise me on what I should be looking for uh, for each individual person that I was uh, trying to betray, and it just kept ballooning and ballooning into what you see today. Uh, I would like to express the fact that I've worked on other projects for other locations, and you go to a community that has one individual that's famous, and they go to a great deal of trouble to showing this person off to the world at great expense. Yet this community has, I believe, at least 27 people, at least that was the last list that I pulled together with my historians going into the 21st century, who are significant in all the ways that you could imagine, from medicine to industry to uh, government, to government the theory, to writers, to poets, you name it. They've been here, or they're already here, right now. And I think it's our purpose to show these people off as much as we possibly can, because it, it's so much more important than the buildings that are here, because the buildings were created by the people. The people are more important than the buildings. So this expressed the people as much as we can. That's my mission, that's why I created this thing in the first place, and why it's so incredible that it <coughs> blossomed in the way that it has. Thank you, Jeffrey. You're a true treasure to this city, and you've answered both of my questions in, in the one, so that's just great. We're going to move on now to um, Skip, and um, unfortunately Marge isn't here, but boy, they are like a team. Um, we describe them as Newburyport's historians extraordinaire. <laughs> I, um, I remember um, I asked them once about Watts Cellar, and all of a sudden in my email comes a, a long uh, package of so much information. Anyway, I digress. Um, so. Uh, Skip, please speak to us of your roles in this project and Marge. I'm quoting you. It started with Jeff as a casual stroll. It ended as a marathon. Over 30 people became involved. It took a village. Uh, Mar Marge would have been here. She had some eyelid surgery at Mass Eye, and she's not yet ready to come before the public with that. <laughs> but she wanted to particularly emphasize the role that Jack played in the early phase of this program, where he was the one that began to see the need, along with what Jeff has said, to have more sculptural representation of prominent American, prominent Newburgh Porters and once he saw what Jeff was doing, he then was very excited and thought that rather than work out on the lawn in some bronze figures that would take a lot of money and many years to do, that Jeff had the answer that could be displayed at the Custom House Maritime Museum. And he brought Joan over, and that is how the program started. It was a stroll at first, and it just sort of grew. Uh, Marge and I handled the concept of what the show was along with the committee. Marge took the role of recruiting, recruiting 14 historians to write the narratives for each of the pieces in the exhibition. And uh, she never had anyone decline 
everyone was responsive. And one of the things that Jeff asked for that we emphasized in doing that was to have not only a historical narrative, but to update it with contemporary comments about how the writer interprets in today's uh, perspective what that sculpture looks like and what that sculpture means. Um, it was a long journey. I think my marriage is safe, but I, was losing, <laughs> I think I was losing room and board privileges <laughs> as we went through this. The, um, the committee, when we first saw what Jeff, I want to sit down for a while, but when I first, we first saw what Jeff was talking about, it was all white males. Very dominant, of course, in the history of Newburyport. And we said, we need to have more female representation in the exhibition. The first choice was fairly obvious to get Anna Jakes, who was born in that in the time period of this Actually, we cover about 100 years from the birth of Reverend George Whitfield, the early 1700s, to the birth of Donna McKay and Anna Jakes in the late 1800s. Anna Jakes was a <coughs> modest, conservative woman who had inherited money from her siblings, unmarried. She was, and her siblings were unmarried. So by the time she was in the 1880s, she had enough money that when she learned from her doctor that a hospital was needed, she went in the next room, brought certificates out, stock certificates, and donated $25,000 for the starting of Anna Jake's. Today, that's worth about six six hundred thousand dollars So she was a clear, although a challenge from a fashion point of view because it was only this headshot of her. And uh, Lois Vallejo was the fashion costume historian that, that filled her figure in in three dimensionals, including the hat and, and things. So, and she did that on others as well. But we still felt we were underrepresented in, from a, his, a woman's point of view. And, uh, the idea, and we also pointed out, there was not an enslaved person in the exhibition. Now, many people here know that there was slavery in Massachusetts in the 1750s. Newberry uh, counted about 50. They were called servants for life, but they were, they were sold, they were bought, they ended up on the property along with cattle, kettle, and the slaves. The report had fewer in the 1770s, but we needed, we needed a, uh, as Bethany had warned us when we approached her on this subject, you need a historical precedent. Jeff had, had done a study of an enslaved woman, and it looked a little bit like someone off the southern plantation, big house, uh, and Aunt Jemima type, and we knew, and Bethany looked at it and says, you've got to have a local precedent. And we found that precedent you know, through the 1771 Massachusetts tax valuation that is now an uh, interactive database on, uh, done by Harvard, but it, it covers every town in Newburyport, probably about 50 different parameters. So we put in a search for Servants for Life and popped up Tristan Dalton and his wife Ruth, and he is a subject of this exhibition. They had three enslaved individuals, probably domestic servants, and a young child in the, in the right age group. So that became the precedent, and then Bethany took that precedent and just expanded to this glorious piece of work that she'll speak about. Uh, that's great. You, you're covering everything I wanted to hear, but we're also going to <laughs> take you to um, that you and Marge were the co-editors of the exhibition book, all 145 pages of it. Can you tell us a bit about that? 
Well, the book grew as the exhibition grew, and Karen Sesto is a, an accomplished graphical designer and layout designer. She did the book. This is what I showed before was the first proof that came in. Is it under your general well, I want to make another point of her. This was the fir first review we did of the book. So we were proofreading, we were talking about content, organization, uh, you know, just the, the kind of style and style sheets and how it does. And this was the original cover design. And Cameron showed it to me. I said, oh, that's Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> She said, oh my God, I could never think of anything else. That's it's not Anna Jakes, that's not Anna sure. Jakes. That's, that's uh, Nathaniel yeah. Tracy. Yeah. And it's a sculpture, but it's taken from the rear and then made into just a silhouette. Well, she changed it at the current book. This is Nathaniel Tracy today, and it's a little bit more interpretive of what he was. Uh, it was. It was a long process. We went through five five proofs uh, to get the book to where it is today. And it was just dramatic to find 150 copies down delivered. So, uh, and it, uh, the, 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 let me talk about what, how, how we came about the, the, the uh, content. The 14 historians were asked to do three things, to write a short, 60, 80 word label that would go under the sculpture, sort of the first thing you would see, and if that's all you wanted, you, you know, you got a quick glimpse. Then for the exhibition, they were asked to run a short, maybe 400 word, short narrative that then went on the panels in this exhibition, and uh, Rose Russo was responsible for that graphic layout, and of course, Jeff wrote artistic statements then the historians were also then asked to write a longer piece, maybe four to seven pages, that went into the, to the book itself. And it, so that was how those all kind of integrated together in Jeff's artist statement. And then John Raleigh did all of the photography of the pieces here, in, done in Jeff's studio with his lighting. But, He's a professional Newburyport photographer, so that part worked out very well. Well, thank you. That's um, just maybe like, Jeff has a yeah. I'd like to say that uh, uh, the Fice and Savings back back in the late '80s produced a book called Faces of Newburyport, which is a little a little book with about twelve historic Newburyporters in it. They updated it in '90. One and ninety-two added a few more names to it, but this book here is probably the most complete and most extensive documentation of these people in this time period. So we hope it's a more than just an exhibit book; it will become a reference book for that purpose. The book also contains an example of his artistic process in, in doing the sculptures from the metal arbiture all the way through to the casting and the final work. We also, as I think I mentioned earlier, asked historians to try to put a contemporary interpretation of their subject. This will make it what could have been written a hundred years ago. And so that, you know, those things came together pretty well, I thought. Excellent. Skip, one last thing. Um, you asked to read a short excerpt from Captain Moses Brown, U.S. Navy. We'd love to hear that. Yeah, I, I want to do that for a couple of reasons. Moses Brown, Captain Moses Brown was a man, he, he was born in 1741 on Rings Island overlooking the Merrimack in the Newburyport Harbor. He was destined to command at sea. He was destined to fight at sea. His, his portrait, one reason I wanted to do it, his portrait is in the collection of the Custom House Maritime Museum down in the Brown Gallery. During the Quasi-War with France, when Newburyport built 
the, the USS Merrimack, the Super War, 28 gun Super War Merrimack, he was chosen as a commanding officer by Newburyport and then commissioned captain of the Navy by the United States Navy. This is the Merrimack, and this is also in the collection of the Custom House Maritime Museum in the Brown Gallery downstairs. Uh, the quasi-war with France was not a quasi-war if you were at sea it was <laughs> firing 50 guns against British, against French uh, privateers. But it was the French Republic that was, after the revolution, that was in dire need of money and they were confiscating American vessels in the Caribbean and East Coast. Newburyport lost 77 vessels. Probably they took 700. And, and the uh, wisdom of the Congress right after the Rev War was to just uh, decommission all, all ships. They had essentially the Navy was reduced to zero, and that, that allowed the French. So uh, Moses Brown was the skipper. He went, the ship was donated essentially to, to the United States Navy by the town of Newburyport, and it joined the Caribbean squadron sailing with the Constitution and two other heavy frigates. And I thought, and there's also a personal note that I want to add at the end of this. And I, so we have Brown born in 70, 1741. He immediately went in as a young man in an apprenticeship, then rising to a captain of merchant ships. He, Brown commanded five brigades and privateers that the Daniel Tracy had, and the Tracy had the largest privateer fleet that had the highest fortune for a short period of time. He gave him command of the Brig General Arnold. The General Arnold was engaged in what Brown called two warm battles against French privateers, against British private. This is during the Revolutionary War. And um, the first engagement, both ships were so badly damaged that the uh, English ship retired. The, the, uh, General Arnold was unable to follow. The next, next engagement, the General Arnold sunk the ship just within several minutes by firing at her hull, so he would got no prize money from either. Three days later, the career of the General Arnold ended. Brown was captured by His Majesty's 50-gun ship experiment. Her commander, Sir James Wallace, asked, are you the commander of that rebel ship? Brown answered, lately I was, now you are. <laughs> Brown was then invited by the Sir, Sir James to attend wine with his officers. Now a, a guest, more, a, a guest, not a, more than a prisoner. So, Sir James offered. Uh, his, Sir James gave a toast to His Majesty. King George III. Then he turned to Brown and gave him, as a guest, the option of offering a toast as well. Brown gave his toast to His Excellency, General George Washington, the <laughs> Commander-in-Chief of the American Forces. Sir James hastily lowered his glass, insulted by Brown. He asked, do you mean to insult me, sir, in my own ship? I, Proposing the name of that scoundrel rebel, Brown replied, No, sir, if there was any insult, it was on you giving a toast as George III, which I did not hesitate to drink to, although you must have known it was not agreeable to me. Who? Sir James quickly saw that he had, that he had violated a breached etiquette. <laughs> then, angry, he accepted the toast, drank to that rebel, that arch rebel, Washington. <laughs> Brown was, of course, in prison, sent to a prison ship. <laughs> 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 Later, 
as he was several other times. Release my. Now I wanted to do one final piece. After discharge from naval service, Brown became captain of a, of a merchant ship. And while returning from Guadeloupe in January 1804, out, out, uh, off the coast of Long Island, he was seized by ap apoplexy two days from Newburyport, understanding the seriousness of his attack. Towards sundown, he asked his crew to take him topside. They rotated him in four directions of the compass, returned him to his cabin. He died an hour later. He was buried at sea, as one writer said, the only proper mausoleum for a man that made his living on the waves. After the sale, his ship, the Merrimack, was decommissioned and sold, sold out by the Navy. They, they sold all of the lower rated ships, kept the frigates, which turned those four frigates were later six frigates, and they were instrumental in the War of 1812, as you well know, the Constitution was quite famous in that. After the sale, Merrimack was outfitted as a merchantman and renamed the Monticello. Then, as indignant to this insult, the ship soon lay a wreck on Cape Cod, lying in one common tomb with her commander, as the Scythian warriors and war horses of old shared one common grave. Brown's wife, Sarah, died in 1806. The captain's wife, she bore the responsibility of raising eight children. Two died young, two sons lost at sea. Through the 38 years of marriage with Moses, typical of people making their living on the sea. As the author of this short statement, I relate to their story. My father was a wartime decorated naval officer, Captain Jesse H. Moster, a U.S. man. My mother, Elizabeth, a Navy wife, raised me over the years of World War II alone. Thank you. Oh, Skip, that was, um, especially your clothes, they're very emotional, very, uh, mm -hmm. there's linkage through generations and history, and we, um... I'm same in apprentice mode, sir. <laughs> there you <laughs> are. Too late to tell, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, let me introduce Bethany Groff Durrell. Executive Director of the Museum of Old Newbury, which we affectionately call the Moon. And yes, many of you still know of it as the Hist. Um, and I, I reviewed this with Bethany. I got myself like foot and mouth, but I'm just going to say it anyway. I have to say it because of the recognition, and you've already said it, Skip, that we found that this last um, maquette um, the negotiations to be really special to all of us. And um, so, of course, and I'm reading verbatim, many times it is said we save the best for last. And Bethany goes, oh, thank you, Bob. <laughs> 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 and I said, I eh, you know, yeah, yeah, I do mean that. But, you know, um, even <laughs> Skip Motes has said that that sculpture is his favorite. I totally agree with that. But you but are you are also the best, <laughs> Bethany. So Bethany will be speaking to us about the maquette negotiations. This was the last sculpture that Jeffrey created. He thought he was close to being done, and then oh my, four more figurines. When I look at this, 
I can almost hear the whispers in the negotiations. It truly makes me want to lean in and listen to those voices from the past. Bethany, we have a perception of women in those early centuries, much of it based on a male-centric society. But oh no, there truly was another reality. Bethany, tell us the need and concept behind the creation of negotiations. Tell us the stories of the three women that make it up. You are so good at giving voices to people of the past. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I think I was really chosen for this project because of my uh, similarity to Anna Jakes and that I'm rich, modest, <laughs> <laughs> and conservative, right? Is that what, is that what you said? <laughs> well, I have to say, I was dragged into this sort of kicking and screaming, but it is impossible to say no to March Motes because yeah. she will find you <laughs> and she will remind you of every favor she's ever done for you. <laughs> And I promise you, she's done all of you a favor, if you know her at all. She's uh, Marjorie Skipper, two of my most favorite people. I can't wait to see the sculpture of them in the notable new reporters pantheon in some, in some future years. Um, so I was brought in along with some, a group of really incredible historians. I mean, the people that wrote the text for these sculptures, in addition to the incredible artwork of the sculptures themselves, is really um, it's really a feat. So I'm in some great company, including some folks that are here. So thank you for letting me be the, the speaker of the, uh, of the writers for the text. So the sculpture was done, and uh, it had a working title of Silent Partners. <laughs> and I approach anything in history uh, with a view to what I know about humanity. And what I know is that no category of women ever in history at any time was silent. <laughs> right? Am I right? No matter what they were told they should be. And I think, uh, so we had the sculpture, and I think I was getting at, I understood exactly what uh, we were getting at with that title, which is this idea that there were women, you know, this idea of behind every successful man as a woman. Well, uh, I think a lot of women were, you know, sort of tripping the men that walking by and, and putting themselves in the center of life. In fact, if you look at, this is an interesting, uh, somebody, to, somebody at another event I was talking at described me as a historian of the lived experience, which I thought was just lovely. Because I think I'm just enough of a, sort of still that punk rock kid that used to hang out at In Street in the late 80s and early 90s, that I want to take a rule or a law, and then I want to see how people actually lived around that, right? Mm -hmm. So think about all of the things, think about, you know, if you were just looking back at the 1940s or 50s about the things that women were told to be or the way that they were, that the law restrained women, you would lose huge uh, amounts of human lived experience in that by not actually just looking at the way people really lived, right? So my first, uh, the first thing I have to apologize to Skip and Marge for is that, and Jeff, is that I, I asked for real people. I didn't want these to be sort of broad caricatures or characterizations of people that were here in the community during this time. Um, and so as, as Skip has said, there was an enslaved woman who worked for the Hooper family. So Ruth Hooper and Ruth Hooper's son and uh, the enslaved woman that worked for her, his name was Flora. Uh, were the basis for those figures in the sculpture. And then there is an unnamed person uh, who is modeled after a sort of um, a seller, a vendor, uh, who would have been sort of, again, living outside of the expectations of women um, at the time. So I, I went back into the record. I tried to look at how people actually were living, in particular how these three women were living, and how other women uh, like them were living at the time. Uh, and there was a very... Uh, again, I think you know the, the people with the least power, the least agency in their own lives were enslaved women. Um, but you look at the way that they were able to, um, you know, there was clearly a, an element of, um, they found ways to exercise, to negotiate power with their employers. In some cases, uh, it's very clear that they had this power because you find Statements like, you know, if my there's a statement, I think it's in the in the book, if my if my girl Lucy 
behaves, she can have her freedom. This elderly man is dying, he's writing his will, and he basically is like, you behave yourself and you'll get your freedom. There's always this like implication that maybe she's not gonna behave herself. <laughs> maybe there's a little bit of a threat there. Even somebody that's been living in your house, you know, for 20, 30 years, there's always this constant negotiation. There are ways to, to use what little bit of autonomy people had. And people have always made uh, a lot, the most of whatever space there is there. Um, and so then I went to the, uh, the record uh, about Ruth Hooper. Ruth Hooper, who's probably the most, so we start with the law of coverture. The law of coverture, which was enforced at that time, basically said that women had no legal personality at all. They had no, they were not a person before the law. They belonged like a child to their nearest male relative. And that was the standard legal standing of the day, right? So if you looked at that and you stopped there, you would think, well, women, what are women doing in Newburyport? They're sitting at home. They're waiting for their husband to come home and tell them what to do. Does that ever happen? Ever? Really? <laughs> but then if you look at what women are actually doing, you know, Ruth Hooper was probably the closest to that ideal in that she'd never worked outside the home. Um, but she herself was using her connections and her power um, to make a, uh, to make, to advance the cause of her family. In fact, it was her connections with First Lady um, Abigail Adams, actually, first, and then also she visited Martha Washington that really helped her husband when he fell in hard times to um, get a, a job that sort of saved the family fortune. She also, as anyone with numerous small children can tell you, was working all the time. Uh, she certainly had help taking care of her children, but she lost three children. She raised the four children of her sister who died. So she was very busy uh, and also used uh, the authority that she had in her social status um, to advance the cause of her family and also you know, was involved in activities that were open to her in the community. So she's probably the closest to the, the, what was considered sort of the ideal. Now, of course, there have always been huge numbers of women that cannot fit the ideal um, of womanhood at the time in which they live for one reason or another, be it their uh, you know, class status, their economic status, their race. Um, and so there is a, this category of working women. So the flower seller in this sculpture, uh, who's a very interesting figure, is very loosely based on a woman that came to sell uh, to the Mosley, was it the Mosley family? Or the Bartlett or family. Um, and it was sort of, you know, one step above sort of a panhandler where people would, you know, women would, they'd grow vegetables, they'd grow flowers, or sometimes they would go pick them and they would bring them into a city. And again, these are women who are really right on the border of respectability uh, in the community. Sometimes they were recipients of charity. Sometimes they, you know, they were. It was a slippery slope. They were. They would slide into actual poverty and you know have to look to the almshouse uh, for support. So there, she is an interesting character. But if you look at women that are working, it's not just that sort of rung of women who have always worked: the servants, the prostitutes, the the street sellers. In every society, there are always women that are working. But there was also a level of uh, female I industriousness that was very unexpected. One of the figures that I cite is that one third, in 1770, one third of the businesses in the central waterfront were owned by women in their own name. Yeah. So these are women that have no legal identity. You know, this again, if you look at the rule and then you look at the actual experience, they're very different. <coughs> And of course, port towns are always a little bit more fluid. They're always a little more, I would say, port towns and frontier towns are very similar in that everybody's got to do everything, right? There's not as much, it's not possible unless you're very wealthy to really differentiate your, your work from another person's work, male or female, adult or child. So there's a little bit more fluidity at the port, but you know, here you are, this is not, these are women owning in their own names. Now let's also talk about all the women that are running businesses in their husband's names, or their son's names, or their father's names. You also know, of course, you know, the record when New Report splits from Newberry, there are absolutely women in that room. The men's votes are recorded, but the women were fighting. <laughs> there's actually records of, you know, women being very vocal about what they felt about Newberry Port separating from Newberry. Go back a little bit further, I know this is not in the realm of, the, of this particular project, but you look at the 17th century court records, you have, which of course you all know, I love desperately. <coughs> but 
you have women in the tavern being extremely vocal and advocating for themselves and for their families. So, you know, you look at the Puritan vision of women, it's incredibly restrictive. It's not borne out by women's lived experience. So it was a great, so negotiations was actually a joke, a little bit of a joke when it started when I first thought of it because I think we had all spent so much time negotiating around the sculpture because to me, all the women in the sculpture are negotiating with each other and with the world. And that was what I saw. It's incredibly dynamic. There's a conversation happening between everyone in that, in that piece. It was very, um, that, that feeling of motion and language and you know, figuring out, am I gonna buy the flowers? Is this woman gonna buy my flowers? You know, is this child gonna run away from me in front of its mother? I'm gonna get in trouble. There's this real dialogue that's going on between those people. So um, thank you for bringing me into that. Again, I'll do anything for you. And it's been a great pleasure uh, to meet and spend some time with Jeff and his wonderful wife, Lindsay, as well. So thank you all for I'm going to add one, on one piece about editing this book. <laughs> Negotiations is the word. We, the, that's the last proof. <laughs> Negotiations had been corrupted by spell check to negations. <laughs> I just said, uh, look, I said, oh, my God. <laughs> wow. That was an awesome typo. <laughs> negations. Women's <laughs> history. No. I not really cut it. Uh, oh, thank you, Jeff. I just love how she can. Um, I just love how she can bring voice to the history, the real voice of of people. And I, you mentioned those court records; those are extraordinary to me. That you know, this is where we can. It's the only way we hear what people were actually saying because they they wrote verbatim what their testimonies were or whatever. Right, and I have to say, you're not going to find a lot of these women who are expressing their opinions and running businesses and all these things, you know, in the sort of, sorry, Institution for Savings, but in the Institution for Savings, you know, 1976 Newburyport Legends book because it, that those roles, as vital as they were, were not privileged in the same way as what men were doing at the same time. So it's, uh, but if you look at, again, you look at those moments where people are recorded in action, and the world is so much more beautiful and complicated and interesting, to me anyway, um, than when you just look at what people are supposed to do and how they're supposed to behave, and what history recorded to serve their own ends. Thank you. That was really terrific. I, I know you all agree. So here's my few words, maybe a few more than a few. Um, <laughs> So I'm Bob Watts. Um, maybe you've noticed me on Facebook. I'm the come for a walk with me guy. Um, I am the vice president of the National Society for the Preservation of Covered Bridges. We are a Massachusetts 501c nonprofit, and we've been around since 1954, the year I was born. We published the World Guide to Covered Bridges. Our eighth edition is just ready for release. It lists every covered bridge in the world, including GPS locations. As one of our members, he has passed away, was Roger Easton, the father of GPS. And hasn't that technology really changed our lives? I had lunch with him once and it was just amazing. So two things that were major attractors to me to come to Newburyport one was the name of the city's mysterious Holy Grail site. Watts Cellar. Maybe I'm related. The other was that it is the home of Timothy Palmer, who is the father of truss bridge design and covered bridges in America. He built the very first bridge crossing of the Merrimack River up the road from here, crossing from Mosley Woods area over to Deer Island and then over to the Salisbury side. Again, keep that in mind. That's the first bridge crossing of the Merrimack. Infrastructure, we gotta have it. It's so important for the growth of business, 
commerce, and the movement of the population. It was a disruptive technology, and I'll leave you to contemplate that, what that means for a few minutes. The initial open trust designs of the two bridges needed were completed in 1792. From there, he went to Philadelphia to build their first bridge crossing of the Delaware, and it was to built to completion as a covered bridge and was called the Permanent Bridge. Upon his return to Newburyport in 1808, he added the covered aspects to the Merrimack Crossing Bridge, drawing on the pure concept of good old Yankee behavior. By putting a roof and sidings over the open truss bridge, it would extend the potential life of the structure from just 10 to 12 years as an open bridge to potentially hundreds of years. This is the true reason for covering bridges, protecting the financial investment of the costs of the bridge. Again, good old Yankee behavior. He built a covered bridge where the Rocks Village Bridge is. He built one for Haverhill, and he built several, many, all over the Northeast. Now back to that disruptive technology. Any answers out there? Shout it out. Come Bowie on. refrigerators. Bowie. Say it again. Refrigerators. Refrigerators. <laughs> the ice industry out of business. Well, there were ferries, too. Well, this is why he's our, our city's historian. Absolutely. For well over a hundred years, multiple, multiple generations, there were ferries. And all of a sudden this guy comes and builds a bridge and these guys are out of a job. I did write that they were pissed. <laughs> um, there were actually riots sometimes, and I don't want to say specifically here, although on the 50th anniversary of that bridge, I was able to... With, Sharon's help had dug into the daily news and, th and they highlighted that there were, there were riots and protests about a bridge going into effect. So, thank you, Jeffrey, for these great works of art. Thank you for that phone call in early 2020 asking me to consult on Palmer and for allowing me to photograph your process over several months. I visited you at least six times and I have to say, one of my personal passions is seeing um, where artists live or where they create. To me, I get very stimulated, very inspired when I can visit that. Um, Jeffrey's studio and house is a visual stimulation that is, it was just incredible. I also want to just give a special shout out to Jason Novak, the creator of the videos that you see. I supplied the ingredients, but Jason turned them into a video masterpieces. The Oscar, please. <laughs> you go, Jason. So thank you, Jeffrey, for this extraordinary gift to our fair city. And I'll speak for the thousands of citizens, visitors, and students that will learn so much from this exhibition. Thank you, thank you. For art, your art, it truly matters. So we're, we're here to congratulate you and say thank you. And can we, uh, <laughs>